Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 24. Scripture says this, But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds, with great power and glory. Then He will send out the angels and gather His elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that He is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. This passage is a response to the question, when is going to be the sign of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem? And it's really important that we recognize that, that we always keep that in front of us. But I want you to notice in these verses first, and this is critical, that Jesus has kind of separated two things. Up till now, in verses 1 through 23, he's been talking about things that are going to happen as the temple is going to be destroyed. And then in verse 24, which we just read, it says, But in those days... After that suffering. So for one moment, Jesus has stepped away from the destruction of the temple and talked about what's going to happen after the destruction of the temple. And he gives no time frame for that, which is really important. But it's after all the suffering we've just been talking about, for those who have been with us. Otherwise, you can just read those verses, verses 1 to 23. After the time of all that suffering, when the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed, it's after that that he'll come back. So that's not a sign that he's coming back, but all that has to happen first, and then he'll come back later. Gives us no idea idea when. But he tells us what it will look like. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from heaven. These are all quotations from the First Testament. And the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. We have to recognize that Jesus does project this out. But then he comes back in verse 28 and starts talking again about the destruction of the temple. And so one of the things we're going to wrestle with today is how do we know that Jesus is telling the truth about who He is, about who God is. How do we know? Is it really the situation that it's simply faith? That's the question we're going to wrestle with today. And we have to admit, I don't think we can start anywhere but with the truth, that many religions claim divine inspiration, don't they? And we recognize that we live in a world in which now all these voices are screaming at the top of their lungs. And so for those of us who are Christians, some of us are just here because we were raised that way. And we've had no reason to question our upbringing. Some of us are here because we've had experiences that we've associated with God and no one's ever going to take that away from us. But there are others who are listening to all these voices and we're wondering what really the foundation of the claims of Christianity is. And interestingly enough, you'll find one of the most powerful bases here in these verses, if you had ears to hear it. On what basis might we consider the claims of Jesus as delivered to us by his first followers as truth? And in order to address that, we have to go back to the Hebraic culture of Jesus. And we have to talk about what the Hebrew people thought a prophet was and how they evaluated whether or not that prophet was a true prophet. For the Hebrew people, a prophet had to be correct 100% of the time. Even one error, and it was proof positive they were not from God. That's pretty high standard. Look at this reading. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 18. I'm just going to read it, but you're welcome to turn there. This is Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning in verse 14. God is speaking to the Hebrew people. The nations you will dispossess... Listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. And let me just define the word. Divination is any attempt to discern what's going to happen in the future by any means. So anyway, the nations you'll dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. That's more or less saying, God has not permitted you to peer into the future. You're not allowed to do that. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, like me, this is Moses speaking, from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb, at Mount Sinai, on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, Moses, what they say is good. 
I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He'll tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to the words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I've not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. So do not be alarmed. So it's a pretty high standard for the Israelite people. Many of these prophets were risen up in the days prior to Jesus. Uh, Isaiah is one of them, Elijah another, Jeremiah, and, and you, the First Testament is filled with prophets who spoke on God's behalf. And this criteria they were all held to. But there were also a lot of false prophets who spoke up on God's behalf, and they got really good at surviving as false prophets by making really fuzzy prophecies that couldn't really be validated. Other prophets spoke prophecies of things that were going to happen so far in the future that there was no way to validate whether or not they were right. But the true prophets of God, they had a practice, and this is so important for us if we're going to understand what Jesus is doing in these verses. They had a practice of prophesying, if they were going to make a prophecy of something far out that was far away, they had to prophesy something that was close. So it could be proven that they were telling the truth. You'll see this in Isaiah, you'll see it in Jeremiah, and it's actually happening in Jesus. Now Jesus provides us in the Gospels with a number of signs to demonstrate the truth of his claims about himself and his relationship to God. He's done a number of miracles, which all are signs of who he was. But he also submitted to the law of Moses by providing the signs that we see required here in Deuteronomy 18. Now, in Mark chapter 8, verses 11 to 12, this goes back a few sermons. The Jewish leaders asked Jesus for a sign. And they're asking for the sign from Deuteronomy 18 that we just read. They want proof that he is truly from God. So they're asking for a prediction. That will have to come true. Now, at that time, Jesus refused to provide the sign then. But he does provide two signs, either of which would have fulfilled the criteria of Deuteronomy. The first is the sign of his death and resurrection. The second is the sign of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And that's the one we're so interested in today, though we're going to talk about both. And the third sign, which of course is the far prophecy, is that he will come again. So being true to the prophetic tradition of Israel, Jesus provided these two nearer signs, his death and resurrection and the destruction of the temple, as evidence that we could believe his promise that he would come again. So let's look at that first sign, the death and resurrection of Jesus. I'm going to give you some passages because Jesus predicts his death three times in the gospel according to Mark. All of them are prior to the chapter that that we're reading today. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 33. Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 32. And Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 34. I'm going to read the last one. This is Mark chapter 10, verse 33. Jesus said, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they'll condemn him to death. Then they'll hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, and spit upon him, and flog him, and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. So Jesus predicts that in the Gospel according to Mark long before it happens. In fact, he predicts it three times. It's not an overstatement to say that Jesus' resurrection from the dead is in every way that matters the foundation of Christian faith. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. Jesus' resurrection is everything for Christians. And I think many of us believe that the lives that his earliest followers lived in light of their experience with him demonstrate its historicity. However, for Mark, just as important as the event of the resurrection is the fact that Jesus prophesied it would happen in advance. But that's been a problem for contemporary people. Because these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were all written long after Jesus purportedly rose from the dead. So many secular scholars then assume that the disciples made up the prophecies as a way of justifying their claims. So even though the resurrection is the absolute essential foundational confession of the church of Jesus, 
in modern times, it's become nearly useless because the world wants to believe that it was made up. And even the Gospels admit that Jesus didn't tell anybody about these prophecies other than his disciples. So there was no public awareness that he had made these predictions. But even with all that said, we at least have to observe that for Mark, Jesus demonstrated that he was truly from God by predicting his death and resurrection before it happened. But sign two, this is the one that is the most interesting. And I don't know if it's one you've thought about before, but I hope you will again. The destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Look at verse 28 of chapter 13. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you'll know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, when you see all that stuff that he had been talking about earlier in the gospel, when you see all that stuff happening, it's time. Verse 30. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. This is an extremely important prophecy. And here are the reasons why. Two interesting things about Jesus' prophecy. First, most critical scholars believe that Mark is the first of the Gospels written. And just about every critical scholar that's worth his salt, whether he's Christian or not, has come to follow the evidence and believe that Mark was written before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Secondly, all of the Gospels, including Mark, indicate that this prophecy of the destruction of the temple was widely known. In fact, it was used against Jesus in his trial. If you turn ahead just a little bit in chapter 14 of Mark, verse 58, you find these words. We heard him say, these are witnesses testifying against Jesus when he's standing in trial uh, in front of the Jewish leaders. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that's made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. So this was a generally, and they thought this was ridiculous and of course they used it against him. So Mark tells us two things about this prophecy. First, it was widely known. And secondly, it was made before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, Jesus says, within a generation, the temple will be destroyed. That's really what that verse means. It has nothing to do with the state of modern Israel. But within a generation, the temple will be destroyed. Jesus spoke those words most likely either in 28 or 33 A.D. I prefer 33. As a matter of fact, uh, Jesus' crucifixion, one of the better dates for it, is April 3rd, 33 A.D. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. That's a historical fact. So Jesus predicted in these verses that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed within a generation of the words he spoke in 33 AD and that some of the disciples who were with him that day would be alive to see it happen. That came true! And Mark was written before it had come true. Mark was finished in the 60s. And he told his disciples it would happen within a generation and that some of them would be alive to see it. And that happened! That's a powerful sign. For Mark, Jesus demonstrated that he was truly from God by predicting his death and resurrection prior to those events. But he also proved that he was truly from God by predicting that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed within a generation of his death and resurrection. And it happened. And so the third sign we see in these verses is in verse 26. Then they'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. That's Jesus' final sign. It's his long-distance prophecy, his promise that he'll come again. Well, why should we believe it? Because he said he was going to die and rise again, and he died and rose again. Because he said the temple was going to be destroyed, and within 37 years, it was destroyed. So you can believe he's going to come back. Because his two early prophecies were both 100% accurate. Deuteronomy 18. In our day, the new miracle workers, the new prophets, are scientists. And like every prophet before them, they too can do miracles. 
And so they've said, look, I healed you. Put your faith in me. If I can save you from cancer, I can save you from everything. And if the Earth's going to get hit with an asteroid, we'll put people on Mars. Science will save us. We'll live forever. But you see, miracles are not the evidence of being from God. Not Jesus' miracles. Not science's miracles. Not anybody's miracles. The sign, according to Deuteronomy, of being from God is the ability to predict with 100% accuracy an event that is yet to come. And Jesus did it. Twice. For Mark, Jesus demonstrated that he was truly from God by predicting his death and resurrection before either event occurred. Jesus demonstrated that he was truly from God by predicting the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem 37 years before it happened. And based on those two signs, Mark suggests that we can know that Jesus was truly from God and that he will come again. Now, there are many evidences that support the claims of Christianity as rational claims. The orderliness of the universe, the consistency and existence of the principles that govern it, and the immediate conditions on and around the earth that have allowed life to develop are all powerful evidences of some sort of design in creation. And so it at least makes the Christian belief in God rational. The, human, the universal human impulse to believe in existence after death, the similarities of justice and ethics across cultures on earth, and the seemingly universal human tendency to grasp at the divine. There's a religion almost in every place on earth, no matter where we go. Those also can be seen as evidences of the reasonability of Christianity's claims about God. And even though all those things can get us to, to the point where we believe that there might be a God or some sort of cosmic force that guides the universe... None of those evidences, as good as they are, really get us to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who became flesh in the person of Jesus, who died for us, rose from the dead ahead of us, and has promised to come again. Like, all, that, all the design and nature, that doesn't get us to that God. It might get us to a God, but it doesn't get us to that God. But to those broader, more universal evidences, we might add Jesus' predictions of his death and resurrection, and his prediction of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem the last of which seems clearly to have been made historically prior to the events it predicted. And we may find that given all of the evidence together, Christianity may be rooted in the most rational soil of all. You see, Jesus and Mark does not simply invite us to believe blindly that he'll come again. And that, therefore, we can remain faithful without fear when the world spins out of control because somebody who lived a long time ago said so. But he asks us to believe on his signs. And they are abundant in this world. Creation, physics, the miracle of his resurrection, and the power of his foresight, his capacity to prophesy not only that he would be killed and that he would rise again, but also that the destruction would be kill would, of the temple would occur within a generation of his words. He gives us evidences. And the challenge for us is, do we believe him? Do we believe them? I think sometimes what we forget, when we read the scriptures honestly, that none of these authors have ever asked us to simply put our faith in a story that sounds good. But they've given us signs and as hard as modern people may work to di discredit those signs, some of them stick. The destruction of the temple in Jerusalem is a fixed point in history. All agree it happened in 70 AD. Jesus' death is a fixed point in history. All agree that it happened between 28 and 33. The writing of the Gospel of Mark prior to 70 AD seems almost universally agreed upon. And you put those pieces together, and right in our own scriptures, we have a prophecy that Jesus should not have been able to make, and yet was able to make. Will you trust these things? Will you take the leap of faith, not out of nothing into nothing, but out of the evidences that God has provided into the truth he claims to represent?